have your Bibles, open up to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. And uh, I'm just going to say uh, a word of prayer this morning. Father, we thank you, we praise you for this time and the service together. Lord, I pray, God, that you will help me, Lord, to <clears throat> minister this word. And that, Father, your people will take it and will use it, Lord, for your glory and for your honor, for your praise. And will not fail to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel 17, and the title of my message this morning is going to be Defying the Enemy. Defying the Enemy. To defy is to come against, to take an offensive measure. And so many times, we as Christians, we're just in a defensive posture. We're fighting, but we're standing still. We need to take authority over the powers of the enemy. We need to be advancing, not to, to be willing to be stagnated or just stationary. When there's a time to stand, there's a time to stand. But when there's a time to fight, we must fight. And I, I think sometimes we get so complacent and we... We kind of like sit back and we just accept things as the way they are. Like I came in this morning and I turned on all the equipment and I turned on the video. And the video would not work. I couldn't get easy worship to flash that up on the screen. It was just a blank Windows screen. And I'm saying, man, what, what happened? And so I turned it off, turned it on, turned it off, turned it on, nothing happened. And I'm saying, well, we won't have video this morning. And I stopped and I said, wait a minute. I'm going to come against the enemy. I'm going to defy what the enemy's trying to do. And so I prayed. I said, and I got mad. I said, devil, I defy you in the name of Jesus. Get your hand off of our equipment and I command it to work in Jesus' name. I shut it, I shut it down. I started it up and it came on. We need to be persistent. And knowing that we battle the enemy and he wants to disrupt not only our service, but he wants to also dis disturb your life. And so if in 1 Samuel 17, it talks about how Goliath was defying the army of Israel. But I want to turn it around and say, you know what we need to do is we need to defy the enemy. We need to come against him and we need to understand that He's more afraid of us than we are of him. Uh, is that true though? Or are you uh, looking at the devil in some kind of Hollywood fashion glasses and thinking that he's this great, ugly, uh, demonic thing that just jumps out at you and scares you and, and puts you in a place of paralysis? No, the Bible says in the book of Daniel, I believe, it says, when we shall see him, we'll look upon him and go... You're the one that caused all the fear? You're the one that did all of this? Because he, what he does is in his evilness, he makes himself out to be real evil. And he is evil. But we don't have to be afraid of that. So I want to read some portions of scripture with you, if I, if I may. You know the story I'm going to share with you this morning about David and Goliath. But I'm going to give you some other aspects of it probably that you haven't heard or known before. In chapter 16, before this even takes place, Samuel goes before the Lord and he says, Okay, Lord, we need a king. Because I know that Saul's days are numbered. And so what happens is, you know the story where uh, Samuel's there and they start to bring all the sons of Jesse before him. And the first son that they bring is Eliab. Isn't that the first one he brought? I believe it was. Yes, it was Eliab. Now Eliab was big in stature. He was, he was a warrior. He was part of Saul's army. And he came, before the Lord. he came before the Lord. And Samuel looked at him. And Samuel, the prophet. Now understand, Samuel was a prophet, right? How many know that prophets don't get everything right? Now, he didn't say, thus saith the Lord, but he thought one thing, and it was God's will for another thing. He looked at Eliab, and it's very important that you understand this as we get on in the, in the scripture about what we're going to share later. 
17 verse, I'm in verse 1 right now. Oh, just this first, first chapter 17. And so Eliab goes before the Lord. 16, I'm sorry, 16. So this is a story where Eliab, you go back and you look in chapter 16. But you don't have to go there, trust me, it's there. If you want to look, if you don't trust me, that's fine too. But in chapter 16, you see Eliab stands before Samuel and before the Lord. He's um, Jesse's oldest son, David's father. And he comes before the Lord, and Samuel, the prophet, looks at him from the outward appearance, and he says, man, he says, surely this is the one. This is the one that's going to be anointed king over Israel. And the Lord says, I refuse him. I don't want him to be the king. He said, because man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And I believe that's so, so true today. There's so many qualified ministers of the gospel. So many good qualified pastors that big denominations won't let them go because they don't have a degree. But I believe there's Davids out there that need to learn how to come and, and be anointed and sent out to serve. And so anyway, Eliab is... is, is Pushed aside, he says, no, this is not the one. He goes through all the sons of Jesse, and he comes and he says, is there not another one of your sons? And he says, yes, there's some little, I got this little teenage kid, you know, he's kind of a little punk, you know. I'm going to kind of paraphrase a little bit if I can. Take a little liberty in today's English. You know, he's, he's out there, but he's, you know, he's, he's worried about sheep and stuff like that. He's out in the field, he's a good looking guy, you know, but he's not too, he's only a teenager. He hasn't really fought in any wars or anything. And the Lord says, Samuel, bring him to me. And the moment David comes before him, the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. Now, some of us think when we get saved, all right, as soon as we get saved, we're called to preach. And that's not necessarily true. David didn't take his throne until 15 years after his anointing. Isn't that something? Fifteen years after is when David fulfills that, that calling and that anointing on his life. Though the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, he had to wait until Saul would leave office. Whether through death or through resignation or whatever. But he would not touch Saul. You remember so many times Saul was out to kill him and he didn't take revenge. So this was the background of what was taking place uh, in chapter 16. And we see that Samuel took the horn of oil, he anointed David. And all Israel knew that David was going to be the next king. Now jump to 17. Let's go to verse 20. Now let's go to verse 17. Can we go to verse 17 first? And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren the ephrath of this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren. 18, next verse. And carry these ten, um, let's see, where am I? Verse 18. And carry these ten cheeses, and unto the captain of their thousand, and look how they, thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. And now Saul... And they that all men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose up early in the morning and he left the sheep with a keeper. And he took and he went as Jesse had commanded him. He was an obedient son. So what we see here is first of all David, number one, he knew what obedience to authority in his life was. And I want to challenge you young people to, to be under authority of somebody in a church, be under the authority of your pastor, be under the authority of your husband. Don't do anything that you would try to do, uh, ladies, without your husband's blessing. So many people fall under a curse and fall under problems because they don't listen to their husband. Now, I want to say this, if your husband's ungodly, or if he's making you do ungodly decisions, you don't have to listen to that. Okay, with all the respect, though, that is due your husband. All the respect. You don't disrespect your husband. But you can willfully disrespect his wishes if he wants you to go in, in 
direct opposition to God's word. And so David listens to his dad and he goes out. and He, he fulfills his father's wishes. And it says in verse 20, And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep where the keeper took and went, and Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to light, fight, and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put a battle in array, army against army, and David left his carriage in the hand and keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came a, up a champion of the Philistines of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke these words. And David heard them. Now remember, David was only about 16 years old. It says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were what? So afraid. Can I tell you, that's what the number one weapon the devil uses, is fear. How many times have you woken up or you have had a dream and you saw this image of this big, big black thing in your room or something happened and you saw something and you got afraid? Well, that's the number one weapon that the enemy uses is fear. But the Bible says that perfect fear, casts, uh, perfect love casts out all fear. That when you have a mature love in Christ, you don't have to be afraid of what the enemy will do to you. Verse 25 says this. And the men of Israel said, How have you seen this man that is coming up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. The enemy's weapon is to defy. It's to come against. It's to stop. It's to hinder. It's to cause any progression in the, in the children of Israel's life. Why? Because... Wherever there's God's anointing, there's always going to be opposition. David was anointed next to be king, and the devil knew that. And he would, he would try time and time again to try to defy Israel and defile Israel through wrong choices. And what happened to David was here, he's, he's listening to this brethren talk, his, his, his Israeli brethren talk, and he says, have you seen this guy coming up to defy Israel? He's come up. What, the man who kills him, the king said this, will enrich him with great riches and give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And I want you to understand that God is always looking for someone to take the lead. God is always looking for someone to stand up against the powers of darkness and say, no, we are not going to have it. It's not going to take place in my home. I am going to take authority over it in the name of Jesus, and we're going to have the victory. We're not going to have a lack. We're going to have a blessing. And in verse 26, he says this. David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? Understand, he's only 16. And he taketh away the reproach from Israel. But then he says this. And I want you to understand that it doesn't matter how old you are. David was 16 years old, and here he has a perception and an understanding of the covenant of God. And he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Now, when we read the word uncircumcised, of course, we think of one thing and one thing only. But that was a covenant God had made with Israel. I believe it was in Genesis chapter 17, when God made a covenant with Abraham. And he told him, he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless your family, and I'm going to bless the land, and, and I'm going to give you a land, and I'm going to give you all this stuff. And the, the, the proof of that is, is I'm going to enter a covenant relationship with you. And how we're going to enter that covenant relationship is that through circumcision of all the males that are eight days old, 
And isn't it amazing that God knows exactly what he's doing because when he said, he could have said the fifth day or the fourth day or the third day or the second day or the first day. But no, he chose the eighth day. Why? Because the number eight represents new beginnings. Are you hearing me? And in the same way, if you calculate the name Jesus Christ, his name comes out numerically 888. New beginnings. New beginnings. Because we have entered into a covenant with the Lord. We have been circumcised not of the flesh, but the Bible says we've been circumcised in our hearts. We've made a covenant agreement with God in our hearts that we we're going to trust him and follow him and worship him all the days of our life. And so here David says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, this guy is, doesn't even have a covenant with God. He's outside of the realm of God's favor. He's outside the covenant promises. And so who is this uncircumcised Philistine to come and try to defy the armies of the what? He didn't say the armies of Israel. He said, the armies of the living God. Amen. Why were they the army of the living God? Because they were living in covenant agreement with God. They were living under the authority of the prophet Samuel. They were living under the authority of the king. See, when you live under the authority of someone, you live in the safety realm of that household or that reign. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this guy anyway? Do you know how tall Goliath was? He was nine feet, six inches tall. I think he was six cubits and a span. I think a cubit is 18 inches and a span is six inches. So if you, by the time you add it all up, he was nine feet, six inches tall. How would you feel if someone nine foot six inches, now I'm six three, so add three more feet to me and another three inches. That's a pretty big dude. Okay? And not only that, he had a full armor on. Okay? And he's coming against, and what he did was, because of what he looked like, he brought fear to the point where Israel was afraid to stand up in battle against him. And that's exactly what the devil does. He comes with this armor, and he comes looking with this armor on to make you think that he's ready for battle, he's ready to fight, and here you are, defenseless. But I got news for you. We are God's covenant people. The church is God's covenant people. And God did not let us go into a spiritual battle without armor. If you look in Ephesians chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, but it says, put on the armor of God. For what purpose? That you may be able to stand against all the wiles or the methods of the enemy. You have been given an armor of protection. You have a helmet to protect your head, your mind, your thinking. The helmet of salvation. Because when you have the helmet of salvation on, you're renewing your mind with the word of God. Your mind's being renewed every day. Amen? Then you have the breastplate of righteousness. And the devil will come, yeah, but look what you did the other day. You sinned. Look what you did over there. Say, but that, hold it, devil. That, I, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus because that's not a breastplate of my righteousness. It's the breastplate of Christ's righteousness. And I have his righteousness applied to me. And that way, your righteousness, if it was, the devil could come and accuse you and you'd be guilty. And you'd feel guilty, ashamed, afraid. And all of those other emotions that you would experience because our righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible says. But when you put on Christ's righteousness, 
the fiery dots of the enemy cannot get through his righteousness because he's righteous because he fulfilled all things. He obeyed the Father in everything. Everything the Father wanted him to say, he said. Everything the Father wanted him to do, he did. And by dying on the cross and, and, and rising from the grave and, and, and seated at the right hand of the Father, now we are justified freely by his grace through his blood. That now we are saved and sanctified. And all we're waiting for now is the glorification of this body when this body will be changed. Hallelujah. So he's given us armor. In Ephesians chapter 6, we got the shield of faith, which quenches all the fiery dots of the enemy. Faith in what? Faith in believing that God has, first of all, given us this armor of protection. Second of all, that he's given us our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, that we can change people's lives by giving them the gospel. The Holy Spirit will do the inner transformation but we can do the outward. We can bring the word of God. And then he says, you got this. You got the sword of the spirit. It's a two-edged sword. To fight the, the devil and all the powers and principalities that are out there in the world. You have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God that you have in your Bible right now. And when you fight the devil, you don't fight the devil on your own terms. You don't fight him in your own terminology. You don't fight him with your own strength. So this tells me that, number one, God has given us better and greater promises than those of the Old Testament. So if this little boy, 16 years old, could fight the devil, and as, as Goliath is representing here, defying the enemy, uncircumcised Philistine, not even enjoying the covenants, of, of Israel that God has instituted. He's an outsider the same way as the devil and his people are an outsiders and God has given us power and he's given us, he's given us uh, equipment and he's given us armor to protect us but not only to take a stand but also to advance forward. You can go and advance forward. You don't have to be stagnated in the things of God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this guy? Next verse. And the people answered after him after this man is saying, so shall it be done to the man that kills him. In other words, he's going to be rewarded. And Eliab, remember what I told you about Eliab? He was the first anointed before the Lord, he was going to go before the Lord to be anointed. And the Lord said, no, I refuse him. That was the first, the, the oldest son of Jesse. When his eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men, Eliab's anger was kindled against David. Why? He witnessed his brother's anointing. You know, the firstborn usually got the blessing in the household. The firstborn gets the father's blessing. And he is to take over in the household. But David was the youngest. And so David got the anointing and Eliab was there at the, at the service and God passed over him. Why did God pass over him? See, because he had everything going on the outside. But on the inside. He had all these emotional problems. He was jealous of David. That's why God says, Samuel, don't judge according to appearance because man looks at the outward appearance, but God judges the heart. And so God knew about Eliab's problems and insecurities and everything that got him angry toward David. And so he got angry at David, and he said, why did you come here? First of all, maybe if he didn't go there, maybe he would have been the anointed king of Israel. Why did you come here? And with whom have you left your few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride. <laughs> David didn't come here on his own initiative. Remember what I told you? He obeyed his father. He was under divine authority. 
He didn't go in pride. He went at the request of his father. So pride was not the real issue here. The real issue is Eliab's pride. See, because the Bible says in uh, Romans, Thou art inexcusable, old man, that judges another, for when you judge another, you do the very same thing. And here, Eliab's judging his brother, telling him, you got this problem, that problem, this is why you did this, this is your motive for doing it, when actually it was all Eliab was being... So always remember that. Sometimes when people are talking and you talk to somebody and you hit a chord, <laughs> you hit something in their life, they're going to come against you. Or they come back at you. And so here David is taking this abuse. So I know your pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. Thou art come down that you might see the battle. Yeah, you want to see us all lose. It's amazing what fear will cause you to do. It's amazing how fear gets God's people into such bondage. That they can't move, they, some of them can't go out of the house, some of them can't do this, some of them can't do that. They're afraid to do this, afraid to do that. <clears throat> if I, I couldn't tell you how many times the devil told me, when I get on a plane, it's going to crash. When I go on a mission trip, oh, you go on that mission trip, the plane's going to crash. That ever happened to you? Plane's gonna crash. So many times. Different countries I've been to. So many times. The plane's gonna crash. Now, if I let fear grip me, I would say, well, I'm not going. But I have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and I come back to the enemy and I tell him this Devil. My time and seasons are not in your hands. You cannot touch me until God is through with me. So you're not going to crash this plane. So get out of my face in Jesus' name. And he goes. Do you know the devil has to obey you? Did you know that? He does. Until your time of appointed time where you must leave this earth to be with the Lord. So when he comes and tells you, you're going to die, don't believe him. He's a liar and the father of lies. He says, you want to just come down here, David, so you can see the battle. So what happens? Now, let me say this. Sometimes you'll be misjudged. Sometimes people will misjudge you. What was David's response? Well, if that's how you feel, I'm getting out of here. I'm going back to my sheep. Is that what he said? No. He didn't let that offense, he didn't let those words penetrate his heart. I mean, we're, we're in such a political, sensitive PC world now. Politically correct. Can't say nothing. Oh, they, wanna, they want to do something to these fifth graders in class. Uh, I forgot what it was, but they, they want to change the whole thing around because they don't want people to get offended. Kids to get offended. That was stupid. It's crazy. You can't say anything. And if you say anything, they put the racial card out. Well, it's because you're a racist. I'm not a racist. Let's see what happens. Let's go down to a verse. Let's go to verse 31. And when he, the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul. 
And Saul sent for him. You're gonna, you have to understand, this is a general in the army. This is someone who's been through battles. He's got captains of the host. He's got lieutenants. He's got leaders. And now he's sending for a 16-year-old boy. Doesn't sound like much of a strategy. Inexperienced. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go out and fight with this Philistine. Notice that David didn't say, Wait a minute, I, I just want you to understand, I'm not qualified for this. I haven't had any kind of basic training. I haven't had any military training. He didn't make excuses. What did he do? He told Saul, he said, Saul, don't let any man's heart feel. Don't get full of fear. Your servant will go up and fight with this Philistine. Now, David was 16, probably 5 foot 2, eyes of blue. And here's... Goliath, nine feet, six inches tall. And in verse 33, he says this. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. If only our military leaders in the United States could take a glimpse of history and look at Israel, and how God has fought for Israel. These are proven factual things that have been written and documented in Israel. When they were in the northern parts of Israel a few years back, and the, uh, I think it was the Syrians or Damascus, or somewhere around there, they, they were fighting with them, and Israel had to flee out of there. Okay? They went to cross their tanks across the field, and one of the tanks blew up because they hit a mind. It was a minefield. So they had the enemy coming in one way and the only way that they could escape was through this minefield. So Israel was trapped. Now they could have surrendered. They could have said, hey, you know what? There's no way we're going to win this thing. But they prayed to God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know what happened? A northeast wind came, true story, blew the sand in the desert and blew the sand off of every single detonator where they could see the detonator and go around the detonator. One of the, one of the times they had another, another attack against Israel and the army that was coming against Israel said when they got just before they got to the, the border, they looked up and they saw thousands of angels. And they dropped their weapons and turned and ran. Oh, if we would understand that when you stand, you may, you may be standing alone by yourself in the natural realm. You may think, here I am and the enemy is coming against me. And I've got... I've got all kinds of things going on, fear and all kinds of uncertainty going on. But understand that in the spiritual realm, if we would only take the same attitude as Elisha, when he was in the chariot with the man, and the man said, we're surrounded by enemies, what are we going to do? And, he, and Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And when he opened his eyes in the spiritual realm, there were chariots of angels of fire all around Israel. Can I tell you, when you're standing up against temptation or you're standing up against the battle with the enemy, I want you to know, though you may be alone, you may be in your room, wherever you may be, but in the spiritual realm, there are thousands of myriads of angels at God's command to protect you as you stand firm in the things of God. Why? Because you are in covenant relationship with Him. You belong to Him. David said, you're not able to fight against this Philistine. How many of you feel that way? You're not able to fight against the devil.
He said, because you are but a youth. You're inexperienced. It's not how young you are. It's do you have God's armor on? And he said, this man here, Goliath, was, is a, a man of war from his youth. He was trained politically, materially, militarily rather. Trained. Fifth degree karate. Expert weapon. Knew how to handle a spear, knew how to handle a sword. had a shield bearer that would actually run in front of him with a shield. Verse 34 is David's response. David said to Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and it came a lion and a bear and a lamb out of the flock. Next verse, please. And I went after them, and I smote them and delivered it out of, the, out of his mouth. And when he arose, that's pretty, that's pretty good, though. To go against a bear that had a lamb in his mouth and he goes and takes the lamb right out of the bear's mouth and kills it. And the lion. He smote him and he slew the bear and he slew the lion. Verse 36. The servant slew both the lion and the bear and, his uncirc and this uncircumcised Philistine, this non-believer, this one who is foreign to the covenants and the promises and the grace and the power and the anointing of God shall be as one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. That's you. That's me. The enemy has lied to us long enough. You, you can hear the enemy's words. You'll never get over this. You'll never get through this. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God has victory for your life. Hallelujah. Verse 37. How many here have had victories over certain battles in your life? Huh? You've had some, some good victories? Well, that should, that should spark a confidence in you that God will continue to give you victory. And David said, moreover, the Lord hath delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw, the paw of the bear. In other words, I've seen God do something in my life. I've seen him deliver me. I've seen him to come through for me. When I prayed, he answered my prayers. I've seen God do some great things. Let those times and seasons that you've been in your life where God has done miracles and worked signs and wonders in your life be to build your confidence in him so that you, like David, can say this, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hadn't happened yet, but David knew it. It wasn't a pride thing. But he knew his God. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Here again, submission to authority. Go, and the Lord be with thee. Even though Saul was not so good a leader. Yet when he was in that office, he was still in the authority. What happened next? Next verse. So Saul says, okay, you're going to go. He says, David, I want you to have my armor. And he put the helmet of brass upon his head. He armed him with a coat of mail upon him. Next verse. David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. He didn't prove it. That's like me taking my suit, my pants, my, my jacket, my shirt, and putting it on Aiden. 
It would look funny, wouldn't it? Pants hanging all down, shirt hanging way down, collar way out to here, arms way down to here. It just doesn't fit. Don't go by somebody else's experiences about what they've done. Don't try to do it the way they do it. It don't fit. Do it the way God has done it in you. David said to Saul, I cannot go with these. I have not proved them. And David took them off. See, if David would have gone in that armor, he would have lost. You know why? Because he would have been trusting in that which Saul provided. So what did David do? He's going to do what God wants him to do, and he's going to let God provide. Next verse. And he took off his staff in his hand. And he went, he chose five smooth stones. You know, five is the number of grace. Oh, hallelujah. It didn't take five stones, it only took one. The first one. He didn't take five in case he missed. But he took the five smooth stones out of the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had in the script. And his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. Watch what happens. Next verse. And the Philistine came on and he drew near to David the man that bare the shield went before him. Remember I told you he had a man that bore a shield? And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him. Today's words are, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. That's like me standing here and little Aiden standing there and he's going to defeat me. I would look at that and say, Aiden... Are you kidding me? I can step on your head. He disdained him, started making fun of him. For he was but a youth, he was ruddy and of a fair content. You don't even look like you had a, a battle. You're so good looking, David. I mean, you, not a scratch on you like you've been in fights or anything like that. What, how's that going to work out for you? You're going to die here, David. Next verse. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with staffs? You think you're going to control me with a, with a stick? You think you're going to overcome me with a staff? And Goliath began to curse David by his gods. You're kidding me, David. Can I tell you what the devil uses? against you and me? Intimidation. He intimidates. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? That's what the devil says to us. Who do you think you are to stand up against me? You're nothing. You're a weak little human being. What do you, you can't overcome me. He uses intimidation. Let's see what happens in verse 44. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. In other words, I'm going to kill you, David. I'm going to destroy you, and I'm going to let your body lay outside so that the birds and the beasts can eat of your flesh. And I'm sure he didn't say it with a smile either. I'm going to destroy you, David. Remember Hulk Hogan? Oh, yeah, baby. He had these big arms and muscles. He was almost seven feet tall. Going to destroy you, David. I'm going to destroy you. Going to destroy you, Carolyn. 
going to destroy you, Basilla. I'm going to destroy you, Vicky. Destroy your family. I'm coming against you, Robert. And David said to this uncircumcised, uncovenant related, under not under God's authority, he said, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But he says, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. When you come against the enemy, you don't come in your own strength. You don't come with your own ability. You don't come with your own talents. You don't come with your education. You come in the name of the Lord because the devil's trying to defy you. Not only is he trying to defy you, he's trying to defile you. And that's when you stand up and say, no more, devil. I am not going to allow it in my life. I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. And verse 46. David says to Goliath, If you've been looking for a victory in your life, say this to the enemy today. This day will the Lord deliver you into my hands. And I will smite you and I will take your head from you. This is a 16-year-old kid. <laughs> I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your head off. And I'm going to give you a carcass Give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day the, unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth. I'm going to do that to you, Goliath. What you plan for me, God's going to do to you through me. And look what it says. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. When you and I begin to take the authority God has given us, you're going to see a greater anointing in this church. You're going to see greater things happen in this church. You're going to see greater deliverances happen in this church. When we all come together in the unity of the faith and we come with a, with a, a knowledge of, hey, we're not letting the devil push us around anymore. You're going to see your families come to Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're going to start taking authority over the powers of the enemy. And when you invite them to church, they kept saying no, no, because they were listening to a, a voice of a spirit. Begin to bind that spirit in the name of Jesus. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Because the Bible says the God of this world has blinded their eyes that they may not see. Lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine. How's the glorious gospel going to shine into them? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You are the ones that are going to bring that light to their life. And as you live in the light that God has given you, and you begin to take authority over that, you will see great things begin to happen. You'll see the atmosphere change. You will see God begin to move where there's been stagnation in your life. Verse 47. So David sat back. No. He said, all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with swords and spears. It's not with natural abilities. It's not through your, your ability to be able to decipher information and give information to people. He doesn't do it by sword. He said, for the battle is whose? Whose battle is it? So God fights the battle, but we get the spoil. He will give you into our hands. <laughs> yeah, the battle is the Lord's. He'll, he's going to fight the battle for you. But that God will never start and fight the battle for you until you make a stand against the Goliaths in your life. The moment you begin to stand up and take authority over those uncircumcised things in your life that have nothing to do with the covenant of Israel. 
The moment you stand up and say, this is it, God will begin to fight the battle. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine got up, he probably was a little angry at David, a little puny guy. He came out to draw an eye to meet David. That David saw him when he was coming. He was getting bigger and bigger. And David receded. He went like this. Oh boy, what did I get myself into? Is that what it says? No. It says, and when David, when he saw Goliath rise, it says David hasted and he ran toward the army. He didn't wait for the enemy to come closer to him. If you've ever had a fight, Oh, you want to fight? Huh? All right, come on, let's go. That's what he did. He didn't say, come on, bring it on, buddy. Come on, bring it on. No. He ran toward. He didn't run away from. See, the more you run toward, the fear will get a little deeper. Get a little bit scarier, but the more you run toward it, the more the armies of Israel will come and fight the battle because it's not your battle, it's the Lord's. Somebody say amen. amen. David ran toward him. And verse 49 says, And David put his hand in his bag, he took out a stone. Those things work pretty good, by the way. I remember as a little boy, I used to hang around Cogsall Street down by the water down there. It was all polluted. We didn't know that at the time. And I made me a little sling with some rawhide. And I took a stone. Now, all you activists, animal activists, don't kill me. And I took that stone and I went like this. About a hundred feet out, there was a seagull. And I went, whoosh! Hit that seagull right in the head. Down he went. Now, I'm not proud of that. But I do know that slings work. David took that stone out of his bag. He put that stone in his sling. He went forward. Wham! That stone came out. That stone came out, Brother Nick. Hit that guy right in the middle of the forehead. Sunk that stone right in his head. What happened to oh, big Goliath? On his face. In the book of Luke, the Bible says Jesus said he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. You know when that happened? When Jesus was on the cross and he said, It is finished. Satan was defeated by the blood of the Lamb. Satan was defeated. That's why he, ro he goes like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour throughout the whole earth. But notice what it says, that Satan is like a lion roaring, seeking whom he may devour, not who he will devour. He has to have permission. All Israel had the victory because they were in covenant relationship with God. Look at uh, Revelation for a moment. Revelation chapter 12, 
Very interesting here too. Uh, uh, Revelation chapter 12 is about Israel. The woman. A lot of commentators say that it's the church. They're, they're not telling you the truth. They're not properly exegeting this particular portion of scripture. They're not using exegesis in this portion of scripture. Those who tell you that woman is Israel, I mean is, is the church, they're wrong. Because if you read it, it says the sun, the moon, and the stars were over this woman. Go back in Genesis and read where Joseph had the dream. He said the sun, the moon, and the stars would come and worship and fall down. That was the brother and that was Israel. His mother and father. And it is brothers. Scripture interprets scripture. But anyway, in this particular portion of scripture, Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. I'm going to finish, I promise. And they, who are they? During this time period of what was going on. It says, and they overcame him, Satan. How? By the blood of the lamb. And the word of their testimony. Are you hearing me? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. In other words, they were not going to shut up under persecution. They were not going to shut up. Now, I remember when Jen first came to church, and she started praying for her mom. She said the enemy came to her, devil came to her, in a dream, I think it was, right? And told her, if you keep praying for your mom, I'm going to kill your children. Hello? That was real, right? Where's the children? Are they dead? How many years has it been? Three? Four? Two years? How is that so? He intimidates. Oh, if you, if you do that, if you start praying for, for your loved ones, I'm going to take you out. So you take me out, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. How do you like that? And I'm going to be preparing with him to come back and defeat you. So you can either, if you want to take me out, to take me out here because I'm going to defeat you here, I'm going to defeat you when I come back with the Lord. So you're defeated anyway. Oh, you'll never win. You'll never win the battle with the devil. You'll never win because I'm more powerful than you. Lion spirit. He's a liar and the father of lies. How he gets a hold of our life is because we believe the lie. That's where his power comes in is when we believe the lie. They overcame him how? By the blood of the lamb. What happened with the blood of the lamb? He was slain on a cross. And they thought they had him. The Romans thought they were going to get rid of this Jew. They were going to get rid of him forever. Devil thought it too. Get rid of this Jew forever. Israel and the Pharisees and Sadducees thought that they were going to get rid of him forever. What happened? He was crucified. He was buried. But the one thing they didn't realize was that on the third day, he was going to rise again. And he has all the victory. All the victory over sin and death. We're going to live with him forever. And if you want to see some battles won in your life, stop giving in to the things of the flesh that are uncircumcised, that are not of God, that are outside his covenant, and begin to claim the promises of God for your life, begin to put on, and t take that armor of God. I want to say this about the armor, please. I know I see people on TV and they, they tell you, make sure when you get up every morning that you put the armor on, put the breastplate of righteousness, put the helmet on, put the sword, put the spirit on, put all that foolishness. You tell me, uh, let me ask Stephen, because Stephen was in the army. When you went on patrol, did they tell you to take off all your gear and just go in your fatigues and your T-shirt and just go walk around and make sure everything was okay? 
No. You had to make sure when you were out there that you had every bit of equipment that you were going to need to defend yourself, right? And your, and your, and your company that you're with. So when you look at this scripture in Ephesians, put on the full armor of God, it's the aorist tense in the Greek, which means to put it on, to keep it on, and don't take it off. Because you're in a battle 24-7. The devil doesn't relinquish. The devil doesn't stop. He comes and he comes and he comes and he comes and he comes. So you need the full armor of God on all the time, even when you sleep. Because sometimes he attacks in your dream. So put the full armor of God on. Know that we have overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The devil had me bound, but Jesus set me free. I was lost in a dead world and with a, with, a, with a dead relationship with God, and now he's made that alive in me. And now I can praise him and worship God in spirit and in truth like I've never done ever before. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I am a new creature in Christ. I have the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit in my life to be able to tread on scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing by any means shall hurt me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has given you power over scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy? All the power of the enemy. Not some. All the power of the enemy. Yes, you do. Now, don't go tempt God and grab a serpent. Don't go trying to prove things. No. The devil has enough, enough ways to come at you. I can tell you one time I was in Kentucky and I... Went and visited somebody, and I was on the, sleeping on their floor. And all of a sudden, something bit me. And when my friend saw it, he said, that's a recluse spider. They're poisonous. If you know anything about spiders, that's, a recluse spider is, is poisonous. And all of a sudden, I started to shake. I could feel the poison going through me. And my friend said, let's pray. And we prayed, and I rebuked it in the name of Jesus. And, and, and before you know it, I... I and he said to me, you want to go to the hospital? I said, why? I don't need to go to the hospital. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. He said, if you drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt you. Now, don't go out and try that and say, okay, God, I'm going to see if it works, because you'll die. I've heard testimony after testimony and reading different t testimonies of missionaries that went into a place and sat down for a meal, and the witch doctor had put poison, enough to kill ten men, in the missionary's food. He sat and he ate all the food, and the only thing that happened to him was he got sick and he threw up, didn't die. And after that, the witch doctor came to him and said, your God truly is more powerful than my God. Lay down all of his stuff and said, I want what you have. Come on. Our God is an awesome God. He's an awesome God, and he can take care of all the situations and problems and, that we go through in life. So my encouragement to you today is know in whom you have believed in and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which he's committed unto you until that day. God has given you power over all the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. All the enemy. Power over all the enemy. All. Say it with me. All. all. The enemy. All that he comes and tries to do, all of his schemes and his wiles and everything that he tries to devise against you. you say, but how am I going to know that? The Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask God, God, give me wisdom in this thing that the devil's trying to, you know, trying to lure me. He's trying to make me, trying to take me away from the things of God. Trying to take me away trying to make me do something I don't normally want to do. Satan doesn't like this message. He doesn't like the blood. That's why you see so many churches, they don't sing about the blood no more. They don't talk about the blood no more. They're taking the crosses out of the churches. They're taking all the things that, that are religious out of it. They're taking the pulpits out of it. Out of there, they're putting all their pink lights, red lights, blue lights, flashing lights, making it look like a nightclub. 
I'm going to tell you one thing, and you listen to your pastor. There's coming a time when all that stuff is going to be done away with. And what's really going to matter is how you stand in Christ. What you stand doctrinally in Christ, steadfast, unmovable, unshakable, that's what's going to make the difference in your life. That you're not going to run to and fro to all of these fancy things that people are putting out there. Because let me tell you, when all of those things go away, so will the people. If you come to church to be entertained, when there's no more entertainment, guess what? You'll go. You'll walk away. But if you stand firm in your faith, knowing that Christ is the only one that will give you the victory and he will fight the battle. Jesus said, I'm praying that your faith doesn't fail. You know Jesus and the Holy Ghost are praying for you, praying for me? And we'll stand firm on this promise that God has given us. Amen?